What's up, guys? This is the Drove by Channel Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Brotherson. And today, I've got a pretty awesome topic here. I'm super excited about this. We're going to bring on Bill Hannon. He is a strength and conditioning coach, and he's also a dirt bike rider, which I think makes this a pretty interesting episode here because you don't often hear the two kind of intersecting. And uh, we want to talk to Bill today to find out some of his ideas for us as dirt bikers, what we can do to be more in shape and be stronger on the bike and have more endurance. And it should just be a super fun podcast. So I'm going to get him on the line here and introduce him and and we'll get going. Just by the way, though, if you shop with Rocky Mountain ATV, please use my links down in the description. You can find my links in the description of this podcast or any of my YouTube videos. I have these links with Rocky Mountain ATV. It won't cost you anything, but you will be uh, supporting Dirt Bike Channel if you use those links, which I would really, really appreciate. So... And enough of that. Let's see if we can get uh, Bill on the line. Hey, Kyle. How's it going? Hey, Bill. How's it going, man? Good. How are you? Very good. Well, I want to introduce Bill Hannon here. Um, Bill Hannon is a strength and conditioning coach. He is an engineer that uh, has turned into a a strength and conditioning coach. It's funny because Bill reached out to me um, clear back in, what was it, November Oh, and by yeah. the way, if you if you want to follow Bill, you can you can follow him on Instagram. It's at engineered underscore strength. Is that right, Bill? Yeah, that's correct. Perfect, perfect. He's also written um, different articles with with uh, different different publications. He's designed training programs. He is an online coach. He's uh, actually even building his own uh, coaching right now and just kind of building out his side of the business. It's pretty exciting. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention as I'm introducing Bill here is. The reason why I wanted to invite him on this podcast is not just because he knows how to train people for the strength side of things. He's also a dirt bike rider. He's an avid dirt bike rider. He's been riding for longer than I have. He's been riding for 20 years. Isn't that right, Bill? Yeah, around around 20 or so. Somewhere, yeah. somewhere in there. And that kind of makes him uniquely qualified to talk about um, these things because there's so many... There's I, I know other coaches out there that can teach you how to lift weights and how to build muscle build strength, build endurance, but there's not that many guys that understand kind of the nuances, um, that a dirt biker is, is looking for. And so that's why I thought it would be an interesting conversation. So yeah, he reached out to me back in November. Um, he said, Hey, look, I, are you interested in doing a podcast talking about, about these, these things? And I was like, yes, I do. I am interested in that. And then we kind of went back and forth a little bit and he sent me a three page outline. And that's when I knew, that's when I knew that he had me hooked because, um, you know, some of the things he said, and I want to get into all of this stuff, but here, here are the two things that really, really hooked me in his outline. And I think that you guys, the listeners out there can under, can relate to this. He said that a fast rider or really, you know, any ride, any speed, if you're on a dirt bike, you're working very hard physically, but you also maintain a, you have to maintain providing precise input controls into the bike. And that combination is, is rare. That combination of power output but also like finite, you know, fine motor skills and gross motor skills. Those are, those are kind of rare. And then the last one that he got me on, which was where I, it kind of hit home to me. He said, Hey, look, look, think about a thought experiment. Imagine if you weighed the same weight that you do now, but you were 10 times stronger. Imagine how much easier your life would be. And I started thinking about that bill. And that's really where you, where you hooked me. Cause I thought, you know, yeah, if I could increase some strength, um, there's probably a whole lot of other benefits that would come off of that. And so I just thank you for reaching out and, and, uh, look forward to talking today. Sure. No problem. Yeah. The, here's the scary thing. That outline was probably five pages of the first draft and I had to cut <laughs> it way down. <laughs> well, it was, um, it's a ton, yeah, I, ton of good info. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and thanks for having me on Kyle. Like I, you know, I've been watching your channel for a while and, uh, you know, I, I love your content and you know, like we talked about yesterday, like you just put out a lot of good stuff that's, you know, just straightforward opinions. Like you don't, you don't BS a lot, you know, it's straight to the point. Like, Hey, I'm riding this bike. This is what I think right now. You know, that really appeals to me, not just as a, a guy that rides moto and, you know, a, a customer of, you know, the people that are selling bikes, but you know, it's, it's logical and there's no fluff to it. So, you know, I'm, really excited to be on today and, and, and talk to you because I'm a big fan of the channel and a big fan of what you do. 
Well, that's cool. And we got a chance to catch up yesterday on the phone, just kind of bouncing some ideas off, off one another. And, and, uh, I knew that we were, we would have some good content. Um, I kind of wanted to start off like this though. Um, and I want to get into your, into your background, but what I really want from you today is some ideas on what I can do to change with change my workouts. And I think a lot of the other dirt bikers are going to want to want to get some ideas too, because I got looking at my, I keep an Excel spreadsheet of all of my workouts. Um, and I'm not like a gym rat or anything. I do all this from my home. I, I bought a rower about four or five years ago. Um, and I've mostly rowed these meters, but I also have a skier and some different things. And I have rowed, not that anyone is counting, but I have rowed 4,784,884 meters as of yesterday. And I am looking to change some things up because I feel like, I feel like I've kind of hit like a little bit of a, a plateau is not the right word, but I, I'm kind of up against a wall and I feel like I need to change some things up. So this is super timely for me because I'm going, look, I'm doing all this stuff. I'm working out, but maybe I need to work out smarter. Maybe there are some different workouts that I should be doing. Maybe I should be changing up the intervals or changing up the time and the distances and all of these things. So it's super timely for me. And I hope a lot of other people get uh, some good info in there. So maybe you can give us, Bill, if you can give us like kind of an introduction into with, you know, your background with engineering and how then that moved over into strength and conditioning, because there's a super interesting story there. Um, maybe we could just kind of start with that and, and see a little bit of your background and also your moto background too. Sure. Yeah. Like, you know, like you said in the intro, like, you know, I kind of took a, a weird path to get where I'm at now as a strength and conditioning coach and, um, went to college for engineering and, and did well all through college and got a good job and, um, you know, moved, uh, out of college up to Chicago and, and worked for, um, a big defense contractor and was basically designing, uh, designing parts that went in fighter jets and helicopters and bombers and stuff like that. And it was, you know, it was a, like I said, it was a good job. Uh, I liked it, but I didn't love it. Uh, it was good security, good paycheck and all that. But, you know, in the back of my mind, it's like, I'm not sure if this is something that I can do for 40 or 45 years. Um, so transition to, uh, you know, I, I met my wife, we got married, she's a chiropractor, and we had a chance to kind of move back to my hometown area and buy her a practice. And that kind of came up and, you know, we decided to make the jump and, and move back to small town, Indiana from the Chicago suburbs. And I took another engineering job and, um, you know, everything was going fine. And you know, as a chiropractor, she's treating a lot of people that are in pain, you know, they have back yeah. pain, joint pain, whatever. And she, you know, she's saying to me, like, you know, these people are not going to get better unless they get stronger. And she, she kind of has like the exercise background too. Her undergrad was in exercise science. She was kind of a gym rat, gym rat, like I was, you know, all through high school and college. And, you know, we enjoyed working out at that point too. And, um, I was kind of coming off of a stage where I had gone through, you know, I, I had gotten to the point where you're saying you're at now with your workouts. It's like, I'm doing the same thing over and over. I feel like I'm in a rut. I feel like I'm not improving anymore. Yeah. At the same time, I'm getting older too. So it's like, you know, the things that I was doing when I was in my twenties and early thirties aren't working as well. I'm gaining weight faster than I ever have. And it's like, holy crap, you know, what's, what's going on here. Um, and I started really researching like, okay, what's, what's the best way for, an adult to train, you know, somebody that's serious about this stuff that doesn't care uh, all that much anymore about the biceps to impress the girls and all that stuff. You know, yeah. not, not that there's anything wrong with that. Like we all want to look good and everything. Um, but, you know, I was looking for the quote unquote answer, you know, what's the best way to train and started reading all these books and articles and uh, CrossFit was just kind of blowing up at that time. And, um, I knew that I also wanted to be strong. You know, I'd kind of grown up strong, grew up as a farm kid, uh, you know, playing sports all through middle school, high school and college. Like my big advantage was I was stronger than almost everyone that I had to compete against. Nice. So I knew, and I knew as an athlete, like, you know, that gave me an advantage. So I, you know, the, the idea that I needed to be strong was, was still there too. And uh, you know, so my, my wife's saying like, Hey, why don't, why don't you, you know, you're learning all this stuff yourself. You're learning how to teach this stuff and coach this stuff. Like, why don't you take this handful of clients that would really benefit from that type of training and start training them. And I did. And it was, you know, that's how I got my start. I had, you know, roughly 
eight or 10 clients and I would train people in the morning from, you know, five to six. And then I drive 45 minutes down to my job, work an eight to 10 hour day, drive home 45 minutes and then coach for another two or three hours. And that was, you know, it was like really cool because I'm doing this new thing. But at the same time, it's like, man, I'm working these 16 hour days or whatever it ended up being. And it's like, I can't do this much longer. Yeah, you know, We've got to figure out which way I'm going to go. Um, and it just kind of happened to be at a time that the project that I was working on in engineering uh, was transitioning. And it was like kind of, we we're kind of wrapping it up. And, you know, they had told me like, after this is over, you're going to go work on this other project. Well, the other thing wasn't something I was interested in. And, you know, I was picking up clients left and right without even trying. And I said, well, let's, let's try this. If you guys are willing to let me go part time, you know, I'll go part time and I'm going to start, you know, picking up my coaching practice. Um, so long story short, I finished up that project that I was working on. They didn't have another project for me to jump on that I was all that interested in. I said, call me back. Would you get some more work that's right for me? <laughs> and I never heard from him again yeah. and just, you know, ran with the coaching thing. And, and, you know, that was back in 2013 or 14 and, you know, I've been a full-time coach since then. So, you know, it was definitely a kind of a weird path to, to get to be a strength and conditioning coach. Most people go to, go to college and get an exercise science degree or something like that. And then, you know, there's all kinds of certifications out there that you can get and, you know, go and do that kind of thing and work as a personal trainer for a while or start your own gym or whatever. But, you know, I, I kind of went, you know, a, a roundabout way and was able to jump into a pretty successful coaching practice right away and then got into the online coaching. Um, and that, you know, I kind of got in at the right time for a company that was really growing and moved my way up with that company and eventually uh, worked as director of operations for a few months and then quickly moved up from there to vice president, um, developed a lot of new systems and programs for that company. And then at the end of last year, I just, you know, decided it was time to, to go do my own thing and I'm writing a book and stuff. So I've got, you know, kind of a lot of irons in the fire, but it's an exciting time. And, you know, it's a lot of interesting stuff going on in, in coaching and online coaching. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the story as to how I got where I'm at. And you know, a lot of people ask me like, you know, do you feel like going through all that the way you did, like going into engineering was a waste? Like, do you feel like you've, you know, you wasted all that time in college and the money? And it's like, no, not at all. Cause I use the principles that I learned in engineering almost as much now as I did when I was designing parts for fighter jets. Oh, that's cool. And that, that kind of blows people's minds. It's like, how, how can that be? And it's like, well, engineering is, is a different type of field. The education you get is teaching you how to learn and how to solve problems versus like how maybe just to memorize a bunch of stuff. Oh, okay. So instead of political science where you just learn about what, what happened, you know, 50 years ago in, in politics and how that might affect us today with engineering, you learn how to think, right? Problem solve is, yep. what, is what you're yep. saying. And yeah, exactly. Cool. Yep. And the, you know, the, like the, you know, I'm a mechanical engineer. So the physical aspects, you know, the, the problem solving specifics to mechanical engineering really helps me out with trying to figure out like, you know, what's wrong with the way that that guy is moving when he's doing that exercise. And, you know, I can just kind of see stuff that takes some other people a little bit longer to see just because I've been trained to do that and That's had cool. to do that with, you know, the mechanisms that I was designing to do, you know, some other physical job in a, in an aircraft, but now it's just, you know, applying that to the human form as they're squatting with a barbell on their back. <laughs> well, that's good. So tell us, cause I'm looking at your Instagram feed here. You guys should go check that out, but, uh, it's engineered underscore strength. There's a lot of weightlifting in here, but there's also dirt bikes in here. I see weightlifting family, um, dirt bikes. I've see, seen a couple of guns in here and I'm going, this guy seems like he's legit. He's, he's got it figured out. <laughs> Yeah. The Instagram thing is like hard for me to figure out, like trying to run it as a business page. Like, you know, how much of my, <laughs> should I, should I put my dirt bike stuff on here? I'm a strength coach. <laughs> hey, you just, you just do you know, it. It helps, it helps us to see that you're well-rounded too, though. You know, that's what I Yeah. Like. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, that's, that's true. And it's, you know, you gotta be true to yourself, right? So yeah. if you, if you can't, can't do that, then nobody else will trust you. But 
yeah, with the, with the writing stuff, like I kind of did that backwards too. I didn't start writing until I was, uh, like 21 or 22. Um, you know, I always wanted a dirt bike, uh, but you know, I don't know if it was, if my parents were afraid of dirt bikes or it was just like, you know, we didn't have a ton of money. Um, but I'd get to ride a four wheeler every once in a while and just like loved it. And, you know, just like beg for a dirt bike all the time. And it's like, no, you know, we can't, we can't do that. Um, so the first thing on two wheels, motorized thing on two wheels, that I got to ride was a moped and that <laughs> we, we tore that thing up pretty quick. And then, you know, I didn't have another, I didn't have an actual motorcycle until, like I said, I was about 22 years old. Um, you know, just got out of college making more money than I've ever had in my life. So I just, you know, like just went on a spending spree, bought a new truck, bought a new Harley, um, you know, got into the riding thing. And, you know, I had, I had friends that rode and, but like, you know, I wanted, you know, I didn't, I didn't really, you know, I liked riding and doing like the Sunday cruises and stuff like that, just cruising around. But like, you know, I wanted to go fast. So I bought some sport bikes, I bought a couple of Ducatis and got into that, started doing track days and stuff. And, you know, like most kids grow up riding a dirt bike and then they kind of graduate to the sport bike. And then once they turn 60 or whatever, then they go by the Harley. Well, like the more I rode and the more track stuff and racing stuff that I started doing, it's like, well, I got to find a cheaper way to do this because crashing a Ducati is not cheap. Um, yeah. and got into, uh, actually got into supermoto first. I went to, went and watched the practice day, rode out to the practice day on one of my Ducatis, watched those guys riding on their, you know, KTMs and DRZs and all kinds of stuff. Um, and, and instantly knew like, okay, that's, that's what I want to do. Went home, found a DRZ to buy and, you know, just started doing track days on, on, on that thing. There was a little cart track that was local to us that, you know, let's go pay $20 and ride all day long. Um, and did some supermoto racing for, uh, two or three seasons. And then, you know, that led me more into the dirt side of things. Cause if you want to be good at supermoto, like most of the guys that were really, really fast at supermoto had, you know, some kind of motocross or enduro background. So, you know, I bought some dedicated dirt bikes and started riding at the off-road park as much as I could. And, you know, found that I enjoyed that just as much as the supermoto plus it's cheaper. <laughs> and, and, you know, at that point it's like, you know, we're gotten married and started having kids. So the, the cost factor was definitely a big part of it. And, you know, that's kind of been the story since then. It's like been, you know, I ride supermoto when I can, I'm, I'm building the, building a supermoto bike for this season, hopefully to, to race again. But, you know, most of my riding time is, is in the dirt now. Um, we've got a family farm that's close with a few hundred acres and some woods and stuff. So, um, get out there as often as I can and the kids are getting into it. So it's a, it's a really fun time to see how quickly they're able to progress on the bike and, and have fun. And, you know, even with my little three-year-old boy, like he, you know, every day, like he asks, like, can we get the dirt bike out? <laughs> it's like, no, it's, you know, we can't do it today, buddy. It's raining. But it's like, you know, it's a really cool time to see see their passion and, and excitement for the sport grow and be able to, to give that to them and share it with them. So that's that's kind of my uh, backwards moto background as well. <laughs> I do cool. everything backwards. That's cool. I can relate to that. I, I didn't even get into dirt bikes until I was 28, so I'm, I'm even a later starter than you are. But um, the interesting thing that I wanted to kind of delve into now is just kind of like, Tell us, as a strength and conditioning coach, when you get a client that their passion is dirt bikes, because um, everyone's got different passions. You know, you mentioned CrossFit, and there, and everyone has a different reason for wanting to work out or, or or get stronger. When you have a client that comes to you talking about dirt bikes, what's different about them from your average average client, and how do you do an intake? What are the types of things that you that uh, that differentiate a dirt biker, or or even is there anything that differentiates us from the the average? client of yours sure and that that's a good question too and i was actually i was thinking about this because we we talked a little bit about this yesterday and it's like you know the, the way i can explain this is you know a, a good coach is really gonna to get to learn like you know who the client is what do they want to do um you know what's their lifestyle like how much time do they actually have to train and work out and, and do this stuff 
Um, but the main thing you want to talk to them about is like, what are your, what are your goals? Like, what do you, what do you want to be able to do? What do you need to be able to do to do the things that you enjoy in life and, you know, your sport or your hobby or even your job. And a good coach will sit down with you and, and, you know, ask you all these questions and, you know, get all the, you know, what's your age, what's your sex, what's your training history like? Um, you know, if you, are you pretty fresh or have you lived a hard life and you got bad knees and a bad back and everything's kind of beat up and all that stuff kind of, kind of comes into like this big picture as to, okay, who is this client? What do they want to do? What is their training going to need to be like? And it's kind of a weird, you know, the, the strength and conditioning industry is, is strange. Like it's, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there that is just kind of people throwing spitballs at the wall to see what sticks. And they're just trying to sell stuff. And the way I thought about this, that, that people would be able to relate to on your channel is like, you know, imagine that, you know, some moto dealer from two States over just gets your phone number and cold calls you and says, Kyle, I've got, I've got the perfect bike for you. And it's like, well, how could that, you know, how would he know? Like, he doesn't know who you are. He doesn't know where you ride or the type of riding that you do, or yeah. if you like two strokes or if you like four strokes or what kind of tires you like or any of that stuff, he's just trying to sell you a bike. So there's a, you know, the analogy with the strength and conditioning world is there's a lot of people out there that are just trying to sell programs or training or coaching without any recognition of, of who is this client that's standing in front of me and what are their actual physical needs and how am I going to have to train him to actually provide him benefit and what he, what he's paying for and get him better at what he needs to do to be better at his hobby, his sport, his job. So that's, you know, that's kind of like the first step in, in any relationship that I, that I have with a client is like you sit down and just talk to them, get to know them a little bit, figure out what do they want to do and who they are. I love that. That that seems like the engineer in you trying to figure out what the what the challenges are, figure out what the problem is and and I love also thinking about, you know, figuring out if he's had a hard life, if he's been a runner or if he was a firefighter or something and he's got bad knees or some some of the things like this and then you can kind of tailor the workouts uh based off of those needs or even if they, you know, if they want to put on bulk. Obviously, not a lot of dirt bikers want to put on a lot of bulk and that's something else right. that that you really want to be sensitive of is building out a program for somebody that's going to get them the maximum amount of benefit for their, their hobby or, or their prescribed purpose, whatever they're doing. So, yeah. And that's, you know, that's kind of like the next step is like you, you talk to them and you figure out what their goals are. And then you as the coach have to go back and do your homework and say like, okay, his goal is to be able to ride all day long without getting tired, without having to stop every, you know, 15, 20 minutes and, and, you know, catch a water break, catch a breather, um, you know, not feel just wasted two or three days after a, a, a day long ride like that. You know, that's, that's his goal. What are the specific physical improvements that I need to target to allow him to be able to do all that stuff? And that's really the, you know, most people don't even sit down and do the goals uh, you know, coaching wise. And then almost, you know, I'd say 99% of coaches won't actually try and figure out like, okay, where are these specific things that I need to target? So I need to target strength or aerobic performance or anaerobic performance, you know, which of those is actually important. They're already just saying like, Oh, here's this method that I like to use. And they just kind of throw it at you and you know, you're going to improve somewhat. Um, but is it going to be optimal? Is it going to be the best bang for your buck and, and get you the most for your dollar? No. So, so that's kind of like that, that next step is like, you know, and, and you know, we need to figure out like, okay, exactly what type of writing are you going to do? And what does that mean for you physically? You know, do you need to be strong? Do you need to have the cardio endurance of a marathoner or you look more like a sprinter? And there's so many different varieties of, of riding. And, um, you know, that's, that's one of the other things, you know, not only are we working hard on the bike and having to control the bike and, and put these very precise inputs into the bars and into the controls. Um, but there's also a lot of variance between, you know, maybe today I'm riding, you know, really slow and tight, um, uh, switchbacks. And then tomorrow I'm riding something fast and flowy. Well, the, you know, the physical needs for those two types of tr training are, are quite a bit different. Yeah. So we, we got to look at those things and figure out what, what's, you know, what's going to be the most important thing to train. And then how do we, how do we fit that into, 
your normal lifestyle and schedule. The, I'll say this, the, the number one thing that gets discounted for riders, and you already brought this up, is the, the strength thing. And, you know, people are almost afraid of, of strength training, you know, in the riding community. Um, you know, because they're afraid that they're going to like, you know, just like beef up and end up looking like uh, Lou Ferrigno or something like that. Like he's a giant dude. And it's like this, this kind of a weird misconception a lot of people have is like, you know, everybody that goes to the gym and trains with, with dumbbells and barbells just gets super huge. And it's like, well, that's not true. And I know it's not true because I've spent a lot of time in gyms and there's tons and tons and tons of people that are spending more time than I do that don't ever get any bigger. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, it's not like you go in there and, you know, you touch a barbell and you do, you know, instantly gain 50 pounds and you're muscle bound and you're too heavy for your bike. You know, that's, that's not the case. (laughs) Um, And the, you know, the thought experiment that you brought up is, you know, an important concept for people to think about is like, you know, okay, what, what is strength really? You know, it's our ability to push or pull on something. It's our ability to, resist gravity when it's trying to pull us down to the ground. So if I could instantly get, you know, if I could snap my fingers or may, you know, wave a magic wand and get two or three times stronger than I am right now, everything that I do in my life would be easier, you know, carrying the groceries, carrying the kids, loading my bike into the truck, uh, standing up on the bike while I'm riding, all that stuff instantly gets easier. And then the other thing that comes in is like, well, is it actually possible to do that? Can you get stronger without getting bigger? And the answer to that is also yes. Now you may gain, you know, a little bit of weight. You know, if you, if you go from 165 to 175, but your squat strength and your leg strength and your core strength, like they they all double or triple. Yeah. You gain some weight, but your ability to control the bike and stand up on the bike and do all that other stuff is going to get, much, much better. And it's going to, going to vastly offset that small amount of weight gain that, that happens. Here's the, here's the other funny thing that I, you know, riders are concerned about like how much they weigh. And it's like, um, you know, there's, I think maybe this comes from, from cycling and, you know, the, a lot of the, a lot of the guys that are into fitness and cycling and stuff, like, you know, they're very concerned with, you know, their, their weight. Because if they're riding on hills, you know, they're working with less than one horsepower. Yeah. So if you gain 10 pounds, like your weight to horsepower ratio changes a decent amount. But, you know, we're, we're riding machines that have, you know, 20, 30, 50 horsepower easily. And it's like, you know, we, we gain 10 pounds, which is less than, you know, for most people, it can be le- way less than 10% of overall weight. And it's like, you got to think about like, well, am I really, now am I really going to be down on performance? Am I, am I using, am I using that much performance of the bike that I'm riding right now? And usually it's, it's the answer to that is no, you know, unless you're riding a a small displacement bike, like on a road race track or something like that, where you're, where you're truly wide open throttle quite a bit of the way around the track, like you're not using all the horsepower of that bike. And, you know, you could, you could say like a, a large weight gain is going to affect suspension performance and, and, you know, just handling it and stuff like that. But most of the time, like if we need to go faster, all we got to do is, you know, twist the right grip a little bit more. You know, there's, there's power on demand if we need it. And most of us aren't using all the power of our bikes, even, you know, a small percentage of the time. Yeah. And, you know, I know that's, that's, that's my case. Certainly riding the, you know, I'm riding the 450 right now. And it's like, uh, you know, I like riding it because it does have the power that's, that's fun, but it's like, you know, I don't, I don't need this. I could survive just fine on the 250 four strokes if I needed to. Yeah. You're what you're six, one, two, what are you? Two sixty ish somewhere. Yeah. Probably heavier than that, but we won't say (laughs) <laughs> I'm just, I'm just looking at some of these pictures and I'm going, so this, this guy is built like a linebacker and I want to get into that a little bit later. Cause it was one of the other, one of our other kind of topics, but something that you said kind of in the middle there, you might not even remember saying this, but it really struck me hard. You talked about maybe their goal, this, this client, maybe one of their goals is just not to be so sore after a ride. I remember five, six years ago, 
I went, it was probably maybe even six or seven years ago. I went on a, a two day ride trip, uh, with a couple buddies and I was so freaking sore, like day two, three, four after that ride trip, I was so sore. I could barely walk. I remember just kind of staggering around the office, um, in those days following that. And I felt like I was 90 years old. And the funny thing is as, as I've gotten stronger and as I've gotten in better shape and better riding shape from a number of different things, I can now go on these ride trips. I ne- I'm almost never sore after a ride trip. And I'm talking multi-day ride trips. You know, it might be three, four days where we're riding 200 miles, 250 miles um, of hard single track and I don't come back sore. And is that a, is that a benefit? Uh, would, you think, would you say that's more of a benefit or, or that's a symptom of um, benefit, symptom, whatever you want to say, of being stronger or just being in better shape or, or the two connected? And is this something that people can look forward to if, if they start working out, they get their training regimen better, are they going to be less sore after some of these rides? Yeah, I, I think it definitely, definitely makes a difference. And it's, you know, I, I think you're right. It's both being stronger and that's, you know, that's going to, that's going to make a big difference uh, in terms of like the soreness in your legs and your back and, and shoulders and arms and stuff like that. Um, you know, being in sh- shape definitely helps like, you know, conditioning and cardio conditioning, uh, anaerobic conditioning definitely helps as, as well. Probably not as much of a difference in, you know, how sore you are. But then the other, the other thing that goes along with that is like, you know, there's, there's stuff that we do on the bike that we just can't replicate like in the, tr- in the training room, in the weight room yeah. or whatever. Um, just, you know, like the way we use our hands, the way we use our feet and stuff like that. Like you're always going to be sore from that type of stuff. Like when it's new to you again. So like, you know, if it's been, a year and you go out and do one of those two day rides, like no matter what, no matter what training you've been doing, like your hands are probably going to be sore. Your feet will be sore. You'll have like little aches and pains just because your body isn't used to doing that. But if you do two or three of those type of rides a month, like, you know, by the time you've, you've done the third or fourth one, it's like your body's used to it again. And that's, that's a big concept that, you know, we talked about like how that's how training basically works. You know, the same way that we get used to those riding um, discomforts and stuff, you know, basically what your, your body is doing is like, Oh, this, this new thing is a stress to me. It's a physical stress. So your body is amazing. And it's in its ability to recognize what that stress is and then recover from it and adapt so that your performance level goes up. And a good example of this is like, you know, the calluses that we get on our hands. So if you get like a really hard day of riding and your gloves, or either old or beat up, or you got a new pair of gloves that just don't fit right or whatever, and you get really bad calluses or really bad blisters on your hand. Well, if that happens, you know, two or three times in a row, like, you know, it hurts less and less and less, and then your hands start to build up calluses. And it's like, so your your body has recognized this this stress that keeps happening to your hands, and its adaptation to that is that it builds up a tougher layer of skin so that when you do another ride like that, it's not a big deal. Like you don't actually hurt your hands again. Yeah. And the same thing happens. Like when we, when we weight train, when we do, you know, consistent rowing or running or, you know, even just riding on the bike, like you get used to that activity because your body adapts to it and makes you stronger, faster, fit or whatever. Um, the downside to that is, you know, you do hit a plateau. Like you do get stuck to a point where it's like, okay, I'm not going to get any stronger or faster or fitter unless I ask my body to do something harder than what I was doing yesterday. And that's, that's the big premise to uh, kind of the organization of how we need to structure our training and make sure that we're continually pushing ourselves to like tackle the next incremental jump. So I'm going to add five pounds to the barbell each time that I do you know, every, every third day or whatever, every, every time that I train and do squats, I'm going to add five pounds. And by doing that, like, it's just a little bit extra stress than it was the last time. So my body recognizes that and say, okay, we're going to get five pounds stronger than we were last time we did this. Um, you know, same thing on the rower, like, okay, I'm going to go a little bit faster this time or a little bit farther than I did last time. And your body will respond to that too. And then you, that way your performance keeps increasing. And, you know, that we, we talk about like needing to change it up. And, you know, sometimes there is a need to make bigger changes in the program, but a lot of people take that to the extreme and say like, well, I just need to do something random all the time. 
and that's that's kind of like the you know the opposite end of the spectrum it's kind of what crossfit has has got into and kind of preaches a little bit and it's like you know our our workouts are random because you're trying to prepare for something that's unknown and unknowable and it's like well <laughs> that makes sense and like you know the you know, I, I also work with um you know some people that are in police fire and military and it's like that really describes like the physical needs of their job because they, you know, a cop goes out on any given day. He doesn't know if he's going to be sitting in these cruiser all day or if he's going to have to fight three or four dudes or if he's going to have to sprint and tackle somebody like he has no idea. So like he's got all these, you know, very uh, different needs that he may have to, he may have to tackle physically. And like, how do I train for that? And it's like, well, we'll just have you do like random training. It's like, well, no, that that'll work for a little while. Like if you're starting from a point that you're out of shape, but we can structure that and kind of break it down and say like, well, you'd probably be better off if you were really strong and you also need to be able to sprint after somebody. Um, are you going to need to be able to jog at all? No, probably not. You know, there's never going to be a time that you're just jogging down the street after somebody. So like, you know, we're going to focus on strength. We're going to focus on sprinting. And those are going to cover almost all these different categories of things that you would have to do. And that's basically what we have to do for, you know, the, the dirt bike rider or any kind of moto rider is like, you know, where do you fall on that spectrum? Are you a racer? Are you a trail rider that wants to do two or three day, day long rides? Uh, are you somewhere, somewhere in between and kind of tackle that and figure out like, what's, what's the best set of categories that we can train that will match up with what you're actually doing on the bike. I love that. And I love that concept. Let's talk about, you know, something that we touched on a little bit earlier, just the strength and, and line, like linebacker size. Cause if people look at, if people look at the pictures of you, they'll go, Hey, I, I, that look, he looks like he could play in the NFL. And that's not really what, I'm, <laughs> that's not really what I'm going for. And that's, that's how I feel. I, I'm 165, 170 pounds, depending on the week. Um, and what I want to do is I want, I want to get stronger, but I don't necessarily want to add a ton of bulk, but let's uh -huh. talk about how that strength is really going to help us on the bike. And cause we talked about, you talked about in your outline about becoming more durable and extending your riding career and just being able to stand up on the bike. So let's riff yeah. on that for a second here of why, cause, cause you already touched on it that some guys are a little bit leery, especially in the, in the riding community, the moto community, they're a little bit leery. I think they look at. Um, some of the professionals like the Eli Tomax or the Ken Roxons or, or even, you know, back in the day, the, the, uh, Ryan, Ryan Villapoto and Ricky Carmichael and these guys, and they're all going, Hey, all these guys are five foot seven or five foot nine and they weigh like 140 pounds. So isn't that how I should look? What's your counter argument to that our argument to that? We've already kind of touched, but let's, let's go on that a little bit more. Talk about some of these benefits of getting a little stronger adding five, 10 sure. pounds of weight. How's that really going to yeah. help us? Yeah. And I, I'll start with, with my anecdotal story on that is like, you know, the, when I, when I first started getting into dirt bikes, you know, I, I'd been riding supermoto, I'd been riding street bikes and stuff. Um, I'd never had to, to ride much where I needed to move around nearly as much and definitely not stand up as much as I do, like as I did when I started riding dirt and, you know, back, back then, like I wasn't training like I do now. So I wasn't strong. And it's like, you know, you get on that dirt bike and you go ride at the off-road park and it's like, you know, after five minutes, you're forced to sit down. Like your legs are just so shot that you can't stand up anymore. So like when that happens, like, you're, okay, you're sitting down, which means you can't control the bike as well, which means your suspension doesn't work as well. And like you crash more. And then it's just like this downward spiral of fatigue. It's like, I'm, my legs are already tired. And then I crashed because I hit a bump and got, you know, bucked up in the air. And now I got to pick the bike back up and I've got to kickstart it. And now I'm even worse off in terms of fatigue. And then I crash again and just like, you know, go through a few stages like that. And then you get, you start to question yourself like, okay, maybe I should just stick to the pavement stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, then I started, started training, started doing the squats and deadlifts and stuff and, and got stronger. And the first thing that I noticed is like how much longer I could stand up on the bike. You know, I went from, from struggling to stand up for 15 to 20 minutes at a time to being able to stand up all day long, no problem. Um, 
you know, wake up, do it again the next day. Um, and, and you know, not be tired or, or sore a couple of days after that. So that was a huge change in terms of my thinking as to, you know, how much it really mattered for, uh, for, for the cyclist. And, yeah. um, you know, the other, the other things that we talk about is like, um, not just standing up on the bike, but like, I, I think some people don't realize like how much better you're able to control everything. Like when you have really strong hips and legs and your core is strong and you can just kind of, uh, you know, you're, you're using your hands to input steering and stuff too. And kind of, you know, throw the bike down underneath you. But like, if you got strong hips, like you just kind of turn a little bit and the bike just like falls into the corner. And, you know, it, it makes that so much easier and, and like, you don't get tired from it. Um, the durability thing is certainly huge. You know, like my kind of tongue in cheek saying is that weak people get thrown off of bikes and they break, you know, strong people get thrown off of bikes and they bounce. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's, I'm going to knock on wood here. And this is another anecdotal story, but I've never broken a collarbone. You know, I've had a bunch of separated shoulders that I, you know, you pick the bike up and you keep riding, but I've never had a broken bone from riding. And part of that I have to believe is from the increased bone density that I get from strength training. So, you know, that's, that's something that we're not just going to benefit from on the bike, but in, in life in general, you know, like if you, if you're lucky enough to make it to 85, 90 years old, one of the biggest problems that we see in seniors of that age is like they they're just kind of fragile and all it takes is one fall and you've got a broken femur or a broken hip or whatever. And like, those are bad news for people of that age. They don't, they don't come back and recover well from stuff like, like that. Like the mortality rate of somebody above 80 that breaks a hip is, is really, really high. And that's, that's sad. And it, because it doesn't really have to be like that, you know, it's easy to, you know, easy to add a little strength training for anybody, especially as they age and, and kind of start thinking about bone density and just general durability and either on the bike or just in life in general. Um, you know, definitely the, you know, the extension of the riding career too. Like, you know, I know personally that, that once I started training, like, you know, I, I've had bad knees since I was in high school. I had knee surgery Oh, it's almost 20 years ago, but you know, I had knee pain, you know, every day, all the time, you know, both my knees would just kind of ache and hurt. And like somehow for whatever reason, when I started squatting, the knee pain went away. Um, you know, I train people all the time through the chiropractic office that have really bad back pain, just chronic back pain, um, sciatica and, and stuff like that, where they get the nerve pain that goes down their leg. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to say that that goes away all the time, but I have yet to train anyone that, that came in and, you know, tried the stuff that I, I wanted to show them and wanted to get them started on that didn't have improvement in their symptoms and didn't feel better. So, you know, if you're the, if you're the beat up X racer that doesn't think you can ride anymore, just cause it makes you hurt so bad, you know, maybe it's an issue of, of just not being strong enough. Yeah. And you know, the, you know, get stronger, the muscles feel better, your joints feel better. There's a, there's a hormonal and chemical component to that as well. Um, you know, people talk a lot about like the, the runner high thing and, you know, runners that run really long distances, like, like they get this burst of endorphins, like past 20 miles or something like that. Well, the same type of thing happens, but on a smaller scale, every time that you weight train, um, you know, my wife, you know, she's, <laughs> She can tell when I haven't trained in a while, you know, I, I get grumpy and get irritated and stuff. She's like, you need to go train, you know, need to go get a workout in. And, you know, every time you come back feeling better, you feel better about life. And it's, you know, it's, it's definitely, you know, chemically induced, hormonally induced, uh, but it's, it's a real thing. So, you know, that's, that's a big part of it too. Yeah. I, that's definitely something for me. I feel and maybe in my cynical mind, I think when I don't work out or I haven't worked out enough in a given week, I feel terrible about myself. And I'm like, sometimes I think it's just me making that up in my mind that I may be losing some ground that I gained. Um, but I do feel, mm -hmm. I do feel better about myself. I don't always feel better physically after I work out, but I feel better mentally that I've just accomplished something. If I, if I keep my workouts up, you know, something mm -hmm. that you, that, uh, I, that popped into my head while you were talking 
is just kind of a power output thing when I'm out on the bike and how that affects my ride and how much power I'm outputting, you know, really can affect everything. The, the thought that I had was if I go riding with my boys, I could ride all day long and I barely even ever break a sweat with my sons. Then I have, um, another guy that I go ride with a lot and he weighs more than me and he's just stronger than me. He's just stronger in basically every single way. He's, he's probably 20, 25 pounds heavier than me and he's a very good rider. And when I ride with him, I'm sweating like crazy. I have to take my goggles off every time I stop and he'll just sit there and he leaves his goggles on. And the reason why is because he's not even that hot, you know, because his power output for whatever reason, we're doing the same stuff. We're going up the same trails, but one of us is working harder than the other, and that's me. And so I'm just gassed, I'm sweating, I'm winded, and I'm sitting there going, I'm working out all the time. How, how, come, this is, how come this isn't getting easier? <laughs> and the only thing that makes any sense to me is because that guy is stronger than me. His well, muscle, that, he's they're, stronger they're, than me, and so he can do. Th- and then some of it, too, is he's not wasting as much energy because his skill level is a little higher, which is another yeah. whole thing we could get into because I feel like there's a lot of wasted energy that we do. And one of the things we do as dirt bikers is we get we get better at not wasting so much energy and and, and using the bike with us and, and not fighting the bike. But in this case, I sit there and I go, I, I think that the reason why he always looks like he is having – a little bit better time than me is because he's stronger than me. And that's yeah. what, and that's what I need to, that, that's my takeaway from some of this is I, I just need to get a little bit more strength and it's going to make some of these things so much easier for me to do. Yeah. The, and the, the skill level thing is, is definitely something we should point out too. And that's, you know, I, uh, <laughs> the, the best ones are like, you know, you're, you're riding trail riding or racing or whatever. And like you, you pull over and stop. And you look over and you see, you see the heavy set guy. And not only is he not out of breath, but he's smoking a cigarette. <laughs> it is, it's like, it's like, man, that's not even fair. So, you know, you, you've got to think like, you're, you're right. Like he's stronger. He's able to move the bike and, and do a lot of things that the weaker person can't do. But you know, that, that skill level is the trump card. Um, but then you got to ask yourself like, okay, what happens when he, when he turns up the, the crank a little bit and he tries to ride, as hard as you are relative to your skill level, you know, if your skill level is lower than his, but you're riding at 90% and he's also starts riding at 90%, he's going to be faster than you. But if he's that out of shape, even though he's stronger, um, you know, what, what's going to happen to his performance? Yeah. He might not be so able to sustain it later. Right. Right. And that's, that's kind of like the, the equalizer too. And like, you know, that's one of the things that, um, you know, we, we talked about this earlier, but the, the skill component of riding is so important. And obviously, you know, I, I would never say like, you know, if you want to get better as a rider and you're choosing between seat time and gym time, go ride your bike. You know, unless, unless you're, you know, already riding five or six times a week, uh, you know, professional level rider that you get all the riding time that you want, your time for improvement is probably best spent on the bike. You know, if you're a guy like me that that struggles to find time to load the bike up and go ride, you know, I know that um, my fitness level now, like if I want to go faster, like I'm probably fit enough to keep up with my skill level. So that's that's what we're aiming for for most people is like, okay, let's let's design a program that works around their schedule and includes riding in it, so that we can make sure that their fitness level is always high enough that they can ride like right up to the top of their skill level. You know, it doesn't impede, it doesn't slow you down because you're out of shape. You know, you can ride as fast as your skill level allows you to, and your fitness level is always right there or above that level and says, okay, we've got, we got more in a tank physically wise. You know, we, I got plenty of strength and reserve. I got conditioning and reserve so that I can improve my skills when I'm on the bike. And that's a, that's a big thing to consider. Cause like, you know, a lot of times what happens is the, uh, you see it in brand new riders and you see it in riders that are coming back after a long layoff. You know, you're talking like you know, a year or two off the bike. Um, they're trying to improve their skill level again at the same time that they're trying to improve their fitness and they're trying to do it all at the same time on the bike. And it's just like this, uh, you know, everything's falling apart at the same time. And it, it, you kind of get into that vicious downward circle that we talked about, like, you get tired because you can't stand up and you're crashing and now you're even more tired. And it's, 
you know, it's, it's not a good situation to be in. So, you know, that's, that's one argument for, you know, I, I want to be fit enough so that my time on the bike is productive and I can work on my skills and I can, I can work on line choice and looking up the trail and, and doing different things without having to worry about like, you know, my, if I, am I crashing physically, am I breathing so hard that I'm going to have to stop here at the next, next pull off or whatever. Yeah. Um, I, I did want to come back on the, on the strength side of it too. It like, you, know, you mentioned like the, the fear of, of, you know, wanting to get, you know, not wanting to get too big. Um, and why, why are all the pros, these little guys? Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's an interesting question. And, you know, I, I would say that not all those guys are, are tiny. You know, every once in a while, every once in a while, like a, you know, a bigger guy will come along. Um, and that's, that's certainly the case too in, in off-road riding. Like you see more bigger guys in off-road than, than you would in supercross, maybe even motocross. Yeah. So, you know, that brings up an interesting question is like, you know, why is that? You know, are they, are they not in as good of shape as, you know, Ricky Carmichael back, <laughs> not Ricky now, but Ricky. <laughs> Ricky's hey, Rick, Rick, Ricky's day. losing some weight now. He's, he's trimming yeah, up. He's, he's trimming up. He's looking good again. Yeah. <laughs> but he, you know, more power to him, man. Like if you, if you do what Ricky did and you want to get fat after that, you go right ahead, Ricky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he's looking good again. Um, you know, but those, those fast guys, I think, I think it comes down to, uh, you know, it's a matter of, of their skill level being so high that it, that it kind of just trumps their physical condition. And, you know, those guys were in, were in really good, um, cardio and anaerobic cardio shape. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll give that to them. There's, yeah. there's, those guys train hard and they, they train hard in that stuff. Were they strong? No, most of them were not strong. Most of them are not strong at that level. Could they, could they maybe even get a little bit better physically if they were better about how they train their strength training? I would say yes. Um, but again, it's a question of like, you know, their skill level is just so dang high. I'm not sure how much the, the physical improvement is actually going to make them better when they're, you know, already just like unbelievably fast and, and able to do these just, you know, truly unbelievable things. Yeah. And like you, you watch them do stuff and it's like, Oh, I, you know, I, I saw what happened there, but I don't understand it. Yeah. And, and, and sustain it for anywhere, you know, from 20 minutes to an hour or something like that. Right. Yeah. Um, but you know, for, for normal guys like us and, and, you know, we're worried about that, that thing where it's like, Hey, I want to get better on the bike. So I want to make sure that I'm in as good a shape as I can be. So it doesn't affect my improvement, my skill improvement. Um, you know, can I get stronger without adding a bunch of weight? The answer to that is definitively yes. Like you don't have to gain, you know, 20 pounds, 50 pounds, whatever to get stronger. And, um, so that's, that's a big misconception. It's like, you don't have to be the 250 pound linebacker to, to be able to improve your riding through increased strength on the bike. And, you know, the, the basics there is like, you know, this, uh, going back again to like how the, how the body adapts to stuff, you know, like most, most programs are kind of random and throwing a bunch of stuff at you and talking about muscle confusion and, um, you know, which isn't really a thing. Um, they don't take advantage of our, our body's ability to get stronger a little bit each workout. So like if I squat today, like, you know, say, say I started you on a strength training program, you know, brought you into my gym, we're going to squat, we're going to overhead press, we're going to deadlift, and then we're going to do some conditioning after that. So today we're going to find the amount of weight that you can squat and I'm going to show you how to do it, teach you how to do it. I'm going to have you squat with proper form. We're just going to find a moderate weight uh, that you can do, you know, somewhat comfortably without your form breaking down. And you're going to do three sets of five and then you're going to do three sets of five on the overhead press. And we're going to do the same thing on the deadlift. And then you're going to come back in two days later and we're going to add five pounds to the bar on everything. And you're going to do that all again. And it's probably not going to feel any harder than it did the day before, you know, the, the session before. And you're going to do that again on Friday, another five pounds. And 
you just keep doing that over and over and over and over. And it's like, you know, such a small increase that your body's like, okay, that's not a big deal. Like, you know, I just did five pounds less than this last time. So I could do it again. Um, you know, it does start to feel harder, but what happens is like those small incremental adaptations stack up so fast that before you know it, you know, you blink your eyes and you went from squatting a hundred pounds to 300 pounds in two, two months. And it's like, you know, I, I know there's people out there right now that think like, well, that's bull crap. Nobody can do that. Well, I, I promise you, I do this all the time. Normal people, young people, old people, you know, everybody can do this. Everybody can, can take advantage of these physical adaptations this way. Cause our, that's how our body is built. Um, so the, the other big part of that is like, you know, your, your training, which is a stress, and then you have to go home and you have to recover from that, which means I have to eat and I have to sleep. Um, so if you don't do those things, uh, your, your adaptation won't happen as well. So if I train and then I go on, you know, I get a work assignment and I've got to work 48 hours straight without sleeping, that's going to affect your body's ability to adapt from that. And then when you go do your next workout, it's going to feel really hard instead of, you know, I go home, I eat, I sleep like normal, get enough calories, get a good eight hours of sleep, come back the next time. It's like, oh, that's not that much harder, even though I added weight. So that's, that's a huge part of it as well. Um, and the, you know, there's a huge difference too. in like, uh, how you're going to be able to adapt depending on like where you're starting uh, what, what your physical starting state is. Like if you're really underweight, just like really, really skinny, it's going to be harder for you to get stronger and, and add muscular body weight than, you know, somebody that's maybe a little chubby when they get started. And the difference there is like the chubby guy has all these physiological resources that the body can pull from. Say like, Hey, we got extra calories and storage. We can start using that stuff. And, we use it to, you know, build, build new muscle tissue and make the bones denser and all that other stuff. And, you know, the skinny guy just doesn't have that. So the skinny guy is going to have to eat a little bit more to gain that 10 pounds. Whereas the chubby guy may not lose any weight at all, but his body composition is going to change. He's going to lean up. Um, you know, fat doesn't directly turn into muscle, but we can break down that fat, use it as energy, use that to build new muscle and you see that dude that's like, you know, maybe he starts around, you know, 200, 220 pounds or something like that. And he's just kind of like a little, little soft around the midsection. Like the fat around his waist goes away. You know, his arms, his shoulders, his legs all get bigger. And it's like, you know, you, you start at 220, you end at 220, but now your strength tripled and your, your body composition is a lot better. And your bike doesn't feel any difference. Uh, you, you still weigh 220 on the bike, but your ability to control the bike and your ability to stand up and everything are so much improved. And that's, that's where the, you know, that's where the sweet spot is. It's like, yeah. you know, taking, taking that athlete that, you know, didn't really gain any weight or even the, the lighter guy that, you know, had to gain maybe 10, 15, 20 pounds in order to, to utilize that stress recovery adaptation process. And it's like, hey, we just we just tripled their ability to perform on the bike and stand up all day and, and go for those longer rides. And it's it's a really cool thing. I love that. What are some of the most important workouts that people could be doing, say, from home? Like, let's say they don't have access to you or to an online coach or, or to a gym. What are some of the best workout <clears throat> methods that they should be focusing on as a dirt bike rider? Is it is it the squats, the deadlifts? Is it a rower? Is it a stationary bike, hill runs. I mean, what, what types of things are we talking about? What would you recommend? Yeah. Um, you know, to, to start that off, I, I would say the, the first thing that we want to think about is like keeping things simple. You know, we, we talked about like figuring out what our goals are and then breaking that down and figuring out like what we actually need to improve. And there's, you know, three main things from that. There's strength, there's aerobic cardio, and that's, you know, aerobic cardio is like, how hard can you work? Uh, when your heart rate's a little bit lower, you know, you're, you're breathing hard, but you're not, you're not maxed out. And then the, the third category is anaerobic cardio. You know, how hard can you work when you're, how much work can you do when you're, when your heart rate is redlined? You know, when you're pushing as hard as you can on the bike, you know, how many, can you do a full lap like that? You know, can you, can you ride that hard for five or 10 minutes? 
and catch up to your buddy. Um, so we're looking at those three categories, strength, aerobic cardio, anaerobic cardio. And within those things, there's different ways we can train each one. Um, you know, for the guy at home that doesn't have, you know, if you don't have a gym, or, gym membership, you know, the, the best case scenario is like, you've got access, you got your own barbell, uh, you've got a rower or a bike or something like that. And that's really all you need to get started. You know, a, a barbell with some weights, a rower and a bike or, or one of the other or a ski erg is, is almost as good. Um, you know, you can even do sprints and stuff like that, but you know, we're going to look at that specific physical target. Like I need to get stronger. I need to improve aerobic cardio. I need to improve, improve anaerobic cardio. And we're going to pick the exercises that are going to give us the most bang for the buck. You know, we don't want to do, you know, there's, uh, that's the other big thing with, with riders is they, they prefer to be out riding, right? Like, you know, if I, if I yeah. gave you the choice, Kyle, like, do you want to spend three hours a week in the gym or do you want to spend three hours, three extra hours a week out on the bike? <laughs> which would you prefer you know you're gonna you're gonna pick the bike because it's actually fun um so you know we don't want to have these big extravagant workouts that you know take two hours to finish and use 20 different movements and a bunch of different exercises and stuff like that like we want to pick one exercise that can do several different things for us and we also kind of want to separate and make sure that we're training each of those categories separately because like you don't you can't really train strength and aerobic cardio at the same time um you know i say you can't really do that like you can do it for a little bit you know if you're just getting started uh there's this thing called the novice effect you know when you're when you're weak when you're out of condition you're out of shape like almost anything you do exercise wise is going to make you a little bit stronger and it's going to make you a little bit more fit but that only lasts for so long. You know, we talked about that plateauing effect and it's like, well, that, that'll last for, you know, four to six weeks before it stops working. And then I've got to find a new method. So we want to start with the, the method that's going to give us six months of progress, 12 months of progress, whatever, you know, something that we can hopefully use for the rest of our life. So in terms of what works the best for building strength, it's going to be stuff like barbell training. Um, and the reason why barbells over dumbbells or kettlebells or something like that, like one, the barbell is just like easy to use. You know, it's, it's ergonomically friendly. It's easy to hang on to. It's also very easy to add like small amounts of weight. You know, we talked about like making that five pound jump each time we do, do our squats. Um, you know, that's, it's not easy to do something like that with a kettlebell because kettlebells only come in, you know, bigger jumps. Um, dumbbells, you can, you can find some that, that have those smaller weight increments. But the other thing that's hard with, with dumbbells and kettlebells is like, you know, once I get, start getting strong, you know, I've got to think about like how I'm actually hanging on to this weight, you know, squat, you can put it on your back and it's going to stay there. Um, you know, can you imagine trying to squat with, you know, holding on to, to 200 pound kettlebells or dumbbells somehow on your body? You know, it's <laughs> like, you know, it becomes physically prohibitive the stronger you get um same thing with like a deadlift or a bench press or an overhead press or something like that then you know the the barbell is going to be the easier tool because it's just a little bit easier to use a little bit easier to load you know it is bigger you know it's, it takes up a lot of space on the floor so it's not quite as convenient um you know if you want to squat you need to be able to have a squat rack and stuff like that it takes up more space um that's not to say that you can't you know, use those other tools that you can't use dumbbells, you can't use kettlebells and still get strong. It's just not going to be as effective over the long term. And then cardio wise, like, you know, there's, there's so many different things that, that you can do and you can use, but we'll talk about some of the main ones, you know, in terms of your aerobic cardio, you know, how much can you work with your heart beating below like that threshold where it's like, Oh my God, I got to stop. You know, that, that how much work can I do? at a pace that I could do all day long. Honestly, the best way for most people to improve that is going to be riding. And it's going to be the, I say the best way, it's going to be the, the way that most people are going to most readily want to do and want to use. You know, if I'm, if I'm working on my aerobic cardio, I want to get that in as many times as I can on the bike. And that's, you know, that, that type of training is just like, you know, going out for a nice kind of moderate pace ride, you know, just get a bunch of seat time, 
um, you know, if you want to, you could, you know, you pick some drills and stuff that you could do and, um, you know, have some, you know, if you're trail riding, you can, you can pick some points on the trail, like, you know, okay, I'm going to ride this, this part a little bit faster, but you know, most of the time it's just, you know, getting your butt in the seat for as long as you can. And then the other type of, of cardio training, the anaerobic that we talked about, you know, that's going to be a little bit harder to train on the bike. Um, because anaerobic training, like you need to be pushing yourself physically really hard. And, you know, for a, for a newer rider or a less skilled rider, that's probably going to be, you know, a little more dangerous Yeah, to be pushing yourself that hard physically. You know, you may be overriding your skill level and that's not, that's not a situation that you want to be in. So for most people, I would say like, Hey, we're going to find another way that you can, you can train that methodology. We're going to have you do, you know, hill sprints. We're going to have you do sprints on the row or sprints on the bike. Um, another really good tool is, is something called a prowler, basically just like a sled that you would push. Uh, you can do stuff like that. You know, there's, there's all kinds of methods that you can use that, you know, sprints, uh, rower sprints, bike sprints are going to, are going to be your best bet for, for the anaerobic conditioning. Um, and when you, and then, when you say sprints, how, how many, how long of, how long are we talking about? hundred meters, 500 meters? What's a good sprint? Yeah, good, say we're doing a question. rower. Yep. Um, so th- to, to train that specific area, you know, if you're the, you're the type of rider that needs that training and, you know, maybe we can, we can break that down here next and, and talk about like the different types of writing and like how, the, how their needs kind of vary. But, you know, say, say you're the, uh, maybe like the most extreme version is, is supermoto racing. Cause like supermoto races are almost always really short. You know, like the races that we used to do, uh, you know, I was racing up in Wisconsin and we'd do like an eight lap main event and lap times were, uh, under a minute. So, you know, you're, you're talking, you know, uh, you know, seven or eight minutes, maybe, maybe six minutes for a really short main. And it's like, you know, that's, that's a true sprint. Like you're going all out almost that whole time. So, you know, that type of rider really needs to work on that anaerobic training because like, you know, the heart rate is going to be pegged when you're on the bike. And the other, the other thing too, about like when you, like when you wick it up and you try and try and ride at a hundred percent like that, it's like your fear, fear level goes up too. And guess, guess what that does to your heart rate? <laughs> Spikes it, right? So, yeah. Yeah. So like, you know, it's, it's a little bit different than what we'd see in the gym. It's like, you know, you can, you can row as hard as you want to and your heart rate's just going to kind of, you know, settle at this high level. Um, but then, you know, when you're on the bike, it's like, well, now I'm riding as hard as I can. So physically my heart rate's already going to be right there at the top, but now I almost crash or like, yeah, I've, I've got the adrenaline of trying to pass somebody or try to hold somebody off. And it, and it goes up even higher. So it's like, you know, extra physical demand on top of that. So, you know, that's, that's kind of like the extreme case, you know, uh, shorter, shorter motos, uh, maybe like some like a LCQ or even, you know, I, I could see hair scrambles, enduro, something like that, you know, needing that anaerobic burst for the end of the race or even a, even a trail rider. Like, you know, I've, I've watched your videos, like you, you're, you're, definitely humble like you're you're a good rider and like when you wick it up you're going pretty good and it's like you know those those instances like you know you're riding with somebody that's faster or a group or whatever you need to bridge that gap and catch back up after you you know slow down or whatever like hey i've got five minutes here where i need to ride close to 100 percent. i've got to make sure i've got that anaerobic cardio that's gonna gonna take me through that and not just waste me and like you know cause me to crash so um, so you asked like, you know, how, how would we structure that in terms of a workout? Um, the shorter, the, the shorter and more intense. And what I mean by more intense is like the more power output that you can put out the better. So what we see is like a, a lot of people kind of get into this. There's, it's almost like a craze, like the, the high intensity interval training, the hit craze, like everybody talks about like doing, well, I'm doing hit training. It's like, well, are you really? Because (laughs) the way this is designed is that you're putting out maximum power output. And like, you know, on the rower, we're talking like, you know, you need to be putting out seven, 800, 900 Watts, maybe a thousand Watts. if You're a bigger dude. And doing that for, let's say 20 seconds. 
and, you know, literally going as hard as you can or almost as hard as you can for that very short time increment. And, and what that does is like, you know, that's such a, such a stress and such a demand on the system that it starts like all these processes in the background. Like even after you stop rowing that hard for 20 seconds, like you're still breathing really hard. Your heart's still pumping really hard. You know, all these things have to recover to get you ready for the next one where the, where the mistake comes in. And what a lot of people do is like, they try and make that rest period too short. So they say, okay, I'm going to do like 30 seconds of work and then 30 seconds of rest and then 30 seconds of work and 30 seconds of rest. What happens is after the first couple of intervals, like they're, they haven't recovered enough to create that high power output level. So they end up just getting slower and slower and slower each interval. And by the end of it, they're just, you know, just kind of hanging on, trying not to die, trying not to puke. (laughs) Yeah. And it's like, okay, like this, this started as one thing and it ended as something completely different exercise wise. (laughs) So, you know, we, we want to make that work period short, like in this 10 to 20 second range, make the rest time long. You know, it could be, even as long as two or three minutes, depending on how much power you're able to put out while you're working and allow yourself to fully recover. So then you can do it again and, and put out that full level of power the next time. It's so, because there's, you know, the, it's, it's so funny to hear you say that because even just yesterday, I pulled up my workout from yesterday in my log and I just, I had read your email and I'm looking through it. And I'm like, instead of rowing 5,000 meters today, I'm going to do like 10 sets of like 30 seconds on 30 seconds off. Cause it's, it's in my rowing like machine, right? It's one of the workouts. I'm like 30 second sprint, 30 second rest. And what happened is the first one, you know, I warmed up first. I warmed up on the bike. I got my heart rate up a little bit and then I go to the rower and I start with this 30 second sprint and I am putting out as fat, as hard as I can. And then I'm resting for those 30 seconds. I'm not fully rested The that next sprint comes up and each subsequent one, I put out less and less power. And by my seventh set, and all we're talking about here is I'm going to do my seventh set of 30 seconds. So I've only, the work period has really only been, what, seven or three minutes? By that se- mm-hmm. seventh one, I said, hell no, I'm resting through this next 30 <laughs> seconds. And then I rested another 30 seconds. So then that, I had like a minute 30, I had a 90 second rest there. And then my eighth, ninth, and 11th one, because I wanted to do 10 of these actual power sprints, they were a little better. But what you're talking about is much more rest because you're saying 20 to 30 seconds on the power and then maybe two minutes or, or something on, on the rest. And I'm going, man, that would have totally changed my workout yesterday because I actually would have been able to maybe do much closer to a, a max power output in those those sprint parts and it would have transformed yesterday's workout. So I'm, I'm excited to hear that. Like, look, if you're going to do intense, these interval things, because all my interval training, every time I've ever done it, it's basically been one to one. It's basically been, Uh if I, if I sprint for two minutes, I'll rest for two minutes. If I sprint, sprint is the wrong word for four minutes. Say I sprint for four minutes on the rower, which is going to be like a thousand meters. But, but if I do that, then I would rest for four minutes. So all my workouts have only been one to one. And what you're saying is let's bring the intensity level even higher and make the rest period longer. And that's how we're going to build our strength. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's the, uh, that's a good point. It's like, you know, when we, we look at these different types of training, the strength training, the aerobic training and the anaerobic training, the anaerobic training is going to be a lot closer to the strength training in terms of how you're using your muscles, um, what, what energy systems you're actually using inside of the cell to fuel your muscles and stuff like that. Um, so there's, there's additive bang for the buck there and the, you know, it will help you strength wise. It will help you develop power. Um, but the, the other follow on, uh, improvements are also really cool in that, like, you know, if you, if you are the type of person that's concerned about like how you look and your body composition and stuff like that, it's like, you know, your body loves these sprint intervals. Like it, it sees those and it's like, okay, we're going to, we're going to burn through fat, like, you know, a house on fire. Um, you're, you know, if you're a male, your testosterone is going to go up. 
you know, it's all these, all these cool secondary benefits from this type of training that you simply don't get. Like if you're more of a distance guy, like you're a runner, jogger, whatever, or all you're doing on the rower is those 5,000 meter up types of pieces. And it's like, you know, the, the benefits are, are amazing from that type of stuff. Um, you know, the, the downside is that it's, you know, it's hard, you know, it's hard to be disciplined and, and make yourself do a set of, you know, five or six or even more of those. And that's, <laughs> that's what I'd recommend for somebody that's just getting started. It's like, Hey, this, this is your first day doing this type of training, like start conservatively. Don't yeah. try and go a hundred percent, like go, go say like, you know, 80%, you know, go, go pretty hard, but not as hard as you can yeah. and just see how it feels. And, and do, do a, you know, four of them, yeah. you know, do 15 seconds on a uh, minute 45 off. That's, that's an easy way to do it too. Like if you're, you know, just set a timer for two minutes, every two minutes on the minute, like you do, you do a sprint for 15 seconds and then you, you know, slow down and rest. And that, that's another thing too, that people I know will ask is like, well, on the rest periods, am I really just resting or should I still be, you know, rowing or spinning slow? It's like, you know, if you really want to do this high intensity stuff, just like completely rest, just sit there. Yeah. yeah. And because after, after the second or third one, you won't be able to do like the, <laughs> the recovery pace anyway. Right. Right. And, no, I get that. Yeah. And you know, if you're just getting started, like, you know, we, we talk, um, you know, we talk about work to rest ratio and like you look at the amount of time that you're doing for your work compare that to the amount of your rest time. And it should be at least a one to five ratio. And probably if you're just getting started, it's probably closer to like one to 10, you know? So if you're, if you're doing 15 seconds of work, you should be resting for 150 seconds. And they're going to oh, be wow. like, man, that's, that seems like a long time. It's two and a half minutes, but um, you know, it, it allows you to really do the next one with, with, you know, feeling like you're ready to go putting in that full amount of power and getting the benefits out of that. Yeah. So, you know, like we, we look at those three different types of training. And like I said, like, if you can, if you're, if you're the rider that's able to, you know, get in three or four rides a week. Awesome. You, even like, you know, just one or two rides a week, you know, that's great. Like you're already getting your aerobic cardio in and then you can focus on, on getting stronger and you can focus on your anaerobic training. Um, you know, but if you're just getting started, I, I would put the, put the um, premium on the strength training and, and worry about that first. And then pick up the anaerobic training as you, as you get more time or as you start to plateau on the strength training too. But the, the strength getting stronger is going to bring you the most bang for the buck. It's actually going to improve how much work you can do both in the anaerobic and the aerobic situations. Because if, you know, if you think about it like this, like, you know, the, this, the strong guy versus the weak guy, you know, the weak guy may have better cardio, but like you give them a task and say like, okay, you're, we're going to, we're going to take these two guys and we're just going to give them like, uh, they're going to carry a hundred pound sandbags up a flight of stairs and just stack them and stack them in the upstairs room. And, and we're going to see which of these two guys can, can do that better. And it's like, well, the, the weak guy, even though he has much better cardio, like, you know, that hundred pound sandbag is like such a hard task for him it's going to be hard for him to keep up with the, with the strong dude and yeah. the strong dude is going to be breathing hard after the first time up and down the stairs. But you know, as long as that doesn't push him too far heart rate wise over the red line, like he can do that all day long because a hundred pound sandbag for a dude that's pretty strong. is just like, you know, it's not a big deal. It's not much heavier than carrying my kids. I can do that all day long. The weak guys like, man, I'm struggling to carry this up the stairs once. And he may be able to outrun me all day long, but you know, you, you start talking about that work capacity thing and like how strength affects that. And it's like, you know, st strength is a, you know, it's, it's, you know, we talked about skill being, being the Trump card in terms of like how fast you're able to ride. Well, strength is the Trump card in terms of your physical capacity. It's going to, uh, you know, it's, it's going to give you, um, like this bonus over the the people that are in better shape than you, but not quite as strong as you are. Yeah. Well, I think the more I think about this, I think this is one of the missing pieces of my riding is because my, my cardio is pretty good. Um, but I, I could be stronger than I am now. And I think that will, that will certainly help me. So let's, let's talk about how much time 
would people want to devote to something like this? Um, let's say, you know, you're going to give yourself a, a training regimen or you're, or you're, or you're going to get in contact with you, Bill, uh, or some mm-hmm. other coach, um, and they want to do the strength training. So let's separate the, the time on the bike. Um, let's just say somebody has been re- in my situation. I'm just going to be selfish here since I know the most about my situation. Um, mm-hmm. I ride, I try to ride once a week in the summer. If it's, if it's better weather and I've got four kids and all this stuff, if I could get two rides in a week, that would be great. One's going to be a shorter ride. One's going to be a longer ride. So let's establish, I'm going to, you know, get that much time on the bike. So there will be anywhere between uh, two to five hours of seat time on the bike, you know, in mm-hmm. a, in a week, then I'm going to do the strength training. How much should I, should I, you know, allocate towards this? Do I need to be, are these 30 minute workouts or these 45 minute workouts? What does it look like generally? Yeah. Like where we would start ideally would probably be about three workouts a week. And they'd, they'd start in that 30 to 45 minute range, but that's, that's going to, you know, that's going to go back to that idea that we talked about where, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm that salesman that calls you up and says like, Hey, I've got this perfect plan for you. And it's like, you know, you may not have three extra days to work out. So, you know, we'll, we'll put that out there and say like, that's the ideal place to start. You're going to, if, if you've got three days that you can train for 45 minutes, perfect. That's going to be the best place for you to start strength wise. Um, but you know, what, what I have to do is like, you know, I'm working with real people that have real obligations. They got families, they got jobs. They may say like, Hey, I can only strength train twice a week. It's like, great. That's better than nothing. Let's get started on a two times a week program. Um, and, and go from there. The other, the other thing too, is like, you know, you, like I've, I've worked with people, uh, like law enforcement people that like, or fire department that have shift work. And it's like, well, I work for 48 hours straight and then I get, you know, two or three days off or whatever. Can I train back to back, you know, Monday and Tuesday. And then I'm off. then I got to work Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then I can train Saturday, Sunday. Can I do that? And it's like, yeah, you can do that, but it's not ideal because then you're kind of cutting out that recovery time in between your workouts that your body needs to be able to adapt. So, you know, I, the ideal program is like you would train Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, each session is going to start probably in that 40 to 45 minute range. And then you just kind of go from there. Now the the downside to getting stronger is that the workouts end up taking longer just because it takes you longer to warm up and you end up having to rest a little bit longer in between your, your work sets. And that's another interesting point that a lot of people, as they're getting started in strength training, they overlook. Cause like, we've got this idea in our head, like, you know, I, I got to get into the gym and I got to be working the whole time. So I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to do squats and then I'm going to do push ups in between. And it's like, well, that's, you know, that's not a bad idea. If all you were concerned about is like burning the maximum amount of calories, mm-hmm. but you know, our time in the gym or our time spent in the garage or the basement with the barbell should be focused specifically on getting you as strong as you can, strong as you can, as fast as you can. So we're going to wipe out that other stuff that you were doing in between sets. You know, you're going to do, you're going to warm up a little bit. You're going to work up to whatever your work weight is for that day. You're going to do a set of five squats, rack the bar, and then you're just going to rest for a little bit. And by say, when I say a little bit, I mean, you know, three to five minutes. Most people hear that and like, Oh my God, that seems like such a, (laughs) such a long amount of time just to be sitting there doing nothing. And it is like, it feels like, you know, what, what am I doing here? But, as you get stronger, you quickly realize like, Hey, I need that five minutes to recover in between these sets. If I don't take five minutes, you know, I don't make, you know, I don't, I don't do all five reps on the next set just cause it's gotten that much harder. Um, so that, you know, the, that's one downside to the strength training is the workouts do get longer as, as you get into it. Um, but there's ways around that. Like you can start, like if you're doing three exercises in a given workout, like you can kind of warm up on your next one while you're doing your first one. And, and cut some time out like that. Um, and then I also like to, you know, for somebody like you that doesn't necessarily want to work out unless he has to like, you know, spend an extra workout day is like, I would include your, your rowing time at the end of your strength workout. So we're going to put in, you know, 15 or 20 minutes on the rower on your, on your ski or your bike where you can get in those, those sprint intervals at the end of the workout. And then you've got, you know, those other two days off 
and you've got two riding days. So, you know, you're basically training or riding five days out of the week. You got two rest days. And that's a pretty solid way to start for most people. And like I said, like, you know, everybody, everybody has their unique situation. So, you know, the coach has to learn to be flexible and say like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to work around uh, your schedule and and your lifestyle. At the same time, like the other thing I want to do too, is like, um, you know, I want, I want to present the optimal plan first and say like, here's what we would do if, if, you know, time wasn't a factor and, and you could get into the gym or, uh, get into the basement and work out as many times as you wanted to, we'd do it like this. If that doesn't work, you know, we'll figure out a plan that works for you. That's cool. And with these, uh, so ideally, you know, start out with three workouts a week, 30 to 45 minutes. That includes the rest time, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. And that, and that, that makes it a little, a little bit less scary because if you're going to do, if you're going to be, you know, having these big rests in between, um, I'm looking at this and I'm going, so does that mean this is a three hour workout? Because I'm, if I'm doing 30 minutes of work and then all the rest in there, I'm like, wait a second, this isn't going to work for me, but, uh, yeah. it makes it a little bit more real- realistic. So talk and that's, to- that's the other, other thing that, that people don't get. And like, we, we talk about these misconceptions surrounding the strength thing. And like, you know, somebody came to me and said like, well, what are your workouts like? And it's like, well, wait a minute, that has nothing to do with what you're going to be doing. You know, I, I am physically different than somebody that's just getting started because I need a different stimulus, you know, a different amount of stress for me to, to achieve this, like, you know, next level of strength. You know, the guy that's just getting started, it's like easy. Like your, your body is not adapted to this, this training stress. So it's like, Hey, these 30 minute workouts work just fine. Now, after you've been training for, you know, five, 10 years or whatever, and you're really strong, like, you know, the 30, 30 minute workout doesn't cut it. But, you know, most people that are only concerned with getting strong enough to increase their performance on the bike, like they don't ever have to worry about that. And it's like, yeah. you know, I can, I can get quite a bit stronger doing these shorter workouts. You know, this is working great for me. And it, it almost becomes like a maintenance thing. Like, you know, if you ride your bike hard and you ride it a lot, like you got to change the oil, you got to change your bearings, you know, you got to get new tires, you got to do all this normal stuff. And it's like, you know, we got to do the same thing with our bodies too. And, you know, it becomes a, it becomes a maintenance item that we've got to check off and say like, yeah, I did that. Um, you know, I'm ready to go ride. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of coaches, a lot of strength coaches too, that are used to working with, you know, athletes that, uh, you know, maybe a strength athlete, like a power lifter or a strong man or something like that. Like those guys, you know, they truly care. Like I, I want to get as strong as I possibly can with, you know, if I'm working with a moto guy, it's like, you know, for me, strength is a means to an end. Strength is a way to get faster. So, you know, I've learned, it's, you know, something you've got to learn as a coach is like, you know, you got to pick your battles. You got to learn to, uh, you know, make sure that your program for the client aligns with their goals. And it's, you know, it's <clears throat> something we get caught up in as strength coaches too. And, and, and like you said, I think I, I'm good at recognizing that because I, I do understand that, you know, most of us just want to go ride and I, I'm in that, I'm in that boat too. You know, I'd rather spend time on the bike than in the gym. And so it's, it's, you know, it's a little bit easier for me, I guess. Yeah. As kind of as we wrap up here, just uh, talk about injuries while weightlifting. The first thing that came the when I told my wife yesterday, kind of after we got off the call, you know, saying, "Hey, maybe I'll get uh, a barbell here, do some deadlifts, some squats, some things like that." Possibly, she looked at me and she's like, "Well, uh, deadlifts are how I um, ruptured a disc in my back last last year and had to have surgery." And she's like, "So, have you thought about that?" And I'm like, "And I'm like." Yeah. So that's a real thing. So can we talk for a little bit about, you know, injuries? It's one of the reasons why I have not been a big time, you know, squat guy or, or, you know, deadlift guy or whatever, because I'm like, Hey, I don't want to injure my back. So what's your response to that? Sure. And you know, that's, that's a, that's a real concern. It's a, you know, it's a concern for any sport too. And I, you know, the, the counter to that, you know, if I, if I was talking to your wife, I'd say like, well, he's much more likely to get hurt on his dirt bike. <laughs> and that's, um, you know, not, not to give a cop out or anything because yeah. like, you know, people do get hurt uh, when they're training sometimes. Um, 
you know, your, your risk of getting hurt goes down when you're training with good form, like you're supervised by a coach, but it still doesn't erase it completely. You know, there, there is going to be some risk there. Um, but it's, it's really, really, really small. And, you know, I don't, I don't know your wife's case if she actually got injured, like, wow. Yeah, she like, was with, you know, she was with was picking a weight up. She was, she was deadlifting with a, a strength coach mm-hmm. and, and, uh, slipped the disc, ruptured the disc and she had to have surgery and it was a, it was not a fun thing. And so yeah. obviously, and she's like, well, I, I was, I think in her situation, she told me, she's like, well, I didn't have enough rest because my hamstrings were super sore. So she's like, one thing yeah. I learned from that is I had done too intensive a workout the day or two or whatever it was before her hamstrings were totally sore. And then she's like, and so that threw my form off. And the next thing you know, I've got this conditioning coach pushing me to do a certain thing. And next thing you know, we're having back surgery. And that, yeah, and that's, so, that's, that's been that one of the sucked. that's been one of the negatives that's kind of come along with you know not the bash CrossFit you know it, dude it was it was cross it was a CrossFitter okay. coach she wasn't doing <laughs> you know, quote CrossFit but it was a CrossFit cult member that that yeah love that them. I, and I really like the the person she's a wonderful woman but it Karen yeah. Karen got injured from it and it's like you were in the presence of a professional doing her workouts and that cost us thirty thousand dollars and and now you it changed your life, you know? Yeah. And there, you know, there, you know, to, to back up, there are like really, really good CrossFit coaches and CrossFit gyms out there that, that, you know, kind of know how to stay away from, uh, you know, pushing people towards the point that, you know, they're at a higher risk of injury. Cause you know, CrossFit's all about like, you know, working, working your butt off, you know, every workout you're going to go in there and bust your butt. And they do some stuff with heavier weights. And it's like when you combine those two things where you're fatigued, uh, it's going to be harder to control your form and you're trying to move heavier weights and stuff. And it's like, uh, it's kind of a recipe for disaster. So, you know, like I said earlier, like the best thing you can do is separate those things. And so much of it is timed too. It's like, hey, we're going to do this one and we're going to move straight over to this one. Whereas what you're talking about is a systematic engineered approach to this where we're going to have rest time and we're not so concerned about getting this other workout in while we keep our heart rate up and muscle confusion and all, all this other stuff. So I know there were other elements at play there, but I just wanted to hear you kind of talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I, I won't say that, you know, it's, you won't get injured. Like there is a chance that you'll get injured. Like I've, uh, I tore my rotator cuff while I was training. Um, and it's, it's the only injury I've ever had in, you know, I think there is a difference between an injury and a tweak. Like, you know, what your wife had was certainly an injury. My rotator cuff, rotator cuff tear was an injury. Um, you see, a, what's more common is like, you know, like a, like a tweak and like, you can get a tweak, like getting out of bed, like yeah. you have a, a muscle spasm in your back or something like that. Like, yeah. you know, the common aches and pains and stuff like that are a lot more common than, um, you know, some kind of, of serious injury that requires a surgery or requires you to be off the bike or out of the gym for an extended period of time. You know, the, those are rare, but they do happen. Um, and I, you know, I'll say that they are less likely to happen with smart training, especially if you're able to train under the supervision of a good coach that, that, you know, really is concerned with coaching with, with the movement quality and, and good form. Um, you know, that tends to go out the window sometimes in some of the CrossFit gyms and they just kind of let them thrash about and go at it <laughs> in, in the name of getting hot and sweaty. And like you said, they're exercising for time and that's, you know, it, it gets people in pretty good shape if they're just coming off the couch, but it's, you know, the long term prospects of that are not good in terms of keeping people healthy. And it's, you know, it's actually an interesting question too, when you think about the business model, it's like, man, if, if a lot of my people are getting hurt, like, is my business model a good one? But anyway, um, you know, that's, that's a legit question. And, and, you know, I, I would say that there is some risk there. The risk of a serious or even catastrophic injury is, is pretty low. It's actually one of the, the more technical papers that I'm working on right now is like, especially with deadlifts, like people are, are, uh, generally scared that like they're going to have this serious spinal injury from deadlifting. And it's like, you know, you, you hear people talk about it online and stuff and there's, there's even videos, you know, there's, you'll see a video of like a guy passing out while he's deadlifting and people will say like, Oh, he must've severed his spinal cord and he's, you know, he's like fell over dead. It's like, no, no, that, 
that is not what happened. Like, <laughs> and I suppose it could happen. It could happen if like the guy had some kind of physical defect or something like that. But if you look at the evidence on, on injuries, like spinal injuries where we have like, um, you know, shattered vertebra or a severed spinal cord or, you know, a seriously damaged spinal cord, like stuff doesn't happen like that outside of car accidents you know, industrial accidents, falls, uh, accidents where there's something heavy falling on top of a person. Um, you know, it's not, it's not the type of thing that happens like when you're picking a weight up off the floor. Yeah. Now, you know, it's, it, you know, something like that could happen in the weight room. Like if you're doing something really stupid and a bar falls on you, yeah, that could really hurt you. But, you know, more often than not, you're not going to have that type of, of accident that happens where, you know, your spine is damaged such that you know, you're going to lose function. You know, can you injure a disc or something like that? Sure. Like, you know, your wife's wife sounds like a good case of that. Um, you know, it's, and it sucks too. And it's like, man, I was just here trying to try and improve myself and get better. And it's like, now I got to have surgery and I'm sure she has follow on effects from that too. Yeah. She had dropped so, foot for a while and she still can't feel her foot. So the feeling yeah. of the foot is probably never going to come back. It, it goes all the way from a foot up to mid calf that is numb two years later. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, for, for me as a coach, like that's, that's sad to hear. And I, you know, obviously like what happens in my gym isn't, isn't always going to happen. Isn't the truth everywhere else. But yeah. like, you know, I don't, I don't have injuries like that. Like I've had a few, um, we've had a couple muscle tears, and like, you know, those tend to not be as big of a deal as people would expect either. It's like, you know, what, what we have in our mind is like, you know, okay, somebody tore their hamstring. It's like, you would picture somebody like laying on the floor, like screaming in pain, you know, rolling around. It's like, well, that's not really what happens at all. It's like they, they're squatting and they feel something weird and they come back up and they rack the bar. And it's like, man, like I, you know, I've got this weird feeling in my hamstring. It feels really tight. And then you have them move around for a while. And if it really starts to tighten up or like, you know, if it's a big tear, you can see, start to see a bruise right away. Yeah. And like, you know, like, okay, they, they tore some muscle tissue there. Here's the crazy thing. Like in, in cases like that, the, the best way to help them heal is to keep them moving. So like, <laughs> say like, okay, I know your hamstring hurts, but you're going to come back in tomorrow and we're going to do some, some squats without weight, you know, just basically like sitting down to a chair and standing back up yeah. and it's going to hurt like crazy, but we're going to do a bunch of those reps to keep the blood flowing. And it's actually going to help the tissue align so it can heal better. So you don't have this big, big scar tissue, uh, you know, bunch in the, in the hamstring that's more likely to get hurt again. And like you take them through that and it's amazing how fast they recover. And that's basically what I did with my, my rotator cuff tear. Like I hurt my shoulder doing an overhead press and I was, I was actually training for a competition and you know, it, I felt it pop and I was like, Oh, that felt weird. And I finished the set that I was doing and you know, I could still move. Okay. And I was, I, you know, cause I was warm, hot and sweaty and stuff. And it like didn't start swelling or hurting right away. And I did two more sets after that and finished it. And I could tell that it wasn't right, but it didn't hurt bad enough that it made me want to quit. So you know, wake up the next day and I can't lift my arm above my head and I can't put on a shirt or anything like that. And so I, I think like, you know, my, my competition's two or three weeks away. Like I'm not going to be able to lift, I'm done. And I was like, well, I, I know what I need to do. And I went back into the gym the next day and just, you know, took a, a wooden dowel rod and, you know, pressed that over my head for about a hundred reps just to get the blood moving again. And, you know, just started slowly adding weight day after day after day. And like within a week or two, like I was back to the weights that I was moving before. Now it hurt and it didn't feel right, but I was able to go do the competition and, and do okay. So I guess the moral of, of that story is like, you know, there, there, there is a chance for injury, injury, you know, a lot of them can be overcome. Usually they're not as severe as like what your wife had happen. And, you know, just, just for clarity, like, you know, that, that process that I'm describing, that kind of like rehab process where it's just like, well, we're going to get you moving again. That works for muscle injuries. I would not use that at all for somebody with like, you know, a joint injury or disc injury in their spine or something yeah. like that. Like that ends up making it worse. But, um, yeah, it's, you know, that's, that's a legit concern. 
And like, you have to weigh that with, you know, the reality of like, you know, how much more likely am I to get hurt on the bike if I continue to ride in the condition that I am yeah. versus the likelihood of, you know, a major injury happening in the gym that requires some kind of surgery. I, I'd say it's like, it's so far in favor of like, you're better off training than not that, um, you know, it's, you know, I wouldn't say don't worry about it, but it's like, yeah, you know, yeah. know that that's a real thing. Know that that's part of the, part of the deal. And, and the other thing with that too, is like the, um, you know, you, you think about like what you, what we're going to be like when we're, when we're older, it's like, you know, all of us that ride and ride pretty hard are going to be kind of beat up and, and have some aches and pains and, uh, you know, walk kind of funny after we get up out of a chair, like once we get into our sixties and seventies. But the ones of us that are still riding at that age are probably the ones that are in good shape and are physically strong right now. Yeah. Yeah. And you're going to be better off. You know, the motion is lotion. Um, Yeah. So I I think it's going to be better. I think it's going to be better off to be stronger and physically active as long as we can be. So. Yeah. 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 If you're going to have aches and pains, like one way or the other, would you rather be physically capable and strong and still be able to do all the stuff that you want to do and have some aches and pains? Or just be like, you know, you're, you're the guy that can't get off the couch and everything still hurts. It's like, well, I'd, yeah. I'd, I'll pick the first one. Well, we've, we've covered so much here. I just want to thank you for your time. It's been super enlightening. And, um, I mean, people are going to have a bunch of questions. If they have questions and they want to, they want to contact you, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you and, and, uh, and maybe get some training from you? Sure. Yeah. You, you mentioned my Instagram already. It's uh, engineered strength on Instagram. We're also engineered strength on Facebook. Um, you can also go to engineered or you can send me an email at bill Hannon, H A N N O N at engineered strength.com. Any of those methods work probably email is probably the best one. Um, but yeah, if you guys got questions, you know, you got questions about what kind of program, um, you'd, you'd want to look at or, you know, equipment or anything like that, you know, happy to help, happy to help you guys get started. You know, I love working with riders. It's something I'm passionate about. And, you know, it's, it's like one of, one of the cool things for me is, is to work with somebody that, that, you know, is trying to improve their physical capability to get better at something that I'm also interested in. So if I get riders that come to me and it's like, man, this is awesome. And they're like, you know, we're, we're going to sit down and we're going to geek out. We're going to talk about your riding program and, you know, the type of riding that you want to do, what kind of bike you're on, and then, you know, what kind of equipment you got. And it's, it's just something that's kind of a, for me, it's definitely a fun process. And, you know, I, I feel like, you know, I, I've got that good mix of, of experience as a coach and experience as a, as a writer that can, can really help people and, and kind of, and, and get them started going down the right track. And hopefully what we've talked about today, Kyle is, is help people like, you know, kind of set their mind straight and maybe even open some eyes as to how we should be training and, and why, and the importance of strength and importance of, of conditioning and how to go about all that stuff. So I definitely appreciate you having me on and give me the chance and the platform to talk about this stuff. Yeah, it's very good. I think it's going to be, um, I'm definitely going to change my workouts and I w- I'm looking forward to kind of getting some more feedback and maybe some online coaching from you. So, uh, awesome. where, where we, uh, are in Utah, I'm in Utah and you're in Indiana. It's going to be tough to be face to face, but I think if we can yeah. get, figure out some of this, uh, online stuff and you give me some pointers here and maybe even tailored some workouts. <clears throat> so these are, these are all types of things. These are all services that you offer, right? You can, you can do that for people if they want, if they're out yeah, of state, absolutely. right? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Any, anything from, from program design to, you know, full online coaching. So, um, one of the, one of the things that, that we normally do with online coaching is like, you know, I, I not only tell you what to do, but you know, you can record it on your, on your phone or with a camera. And I use a program that makes it super easy for you to upload your videos and allow me to watch them. And then I can give you feedback. And, okay. um, you know, the other, the other thing we can do with that is like, you know, we do, Skype or zoom calls and, and just kind of touch base all the time, talk about how things are going. And it's, you know, it's not as good as, you know, if, if you were able to come to my gym or, you know, if, if I was able to come to your house and train you, but you know, I, I think it's the next best thing and it's, you know, it makes it, makes it really easy and really convenient to, to reach out to coaches that you may not have in your community and, and get their, get the benefit of their knowledge and their experience. Yeah. 
And with all, I will say with the, with the online coaching, like I'm, I cannot take more clients until June just due to the non-compete with the uh, last business that I worked for. But, you know, in terms of helping people with, with setting up a, a program or anything like that, I can, I can get started on that stuff right away. That's cool. With all the, uh, on the social distancing we have now, anyway, the, these tele telecommuting things are going to be the best way to go until we can get COVID under control. So yeah. Anyway. Yep. And until there's, until there's robots that, you know, can, can sit in your gym and watch you squat and deadlift and press. Like, uh, I think it's the best thing to do, best way to do it at this yeah. point. Okay. Well, I sure appreciate it, Bill. It's been enlightening and I think it's going to change the way that I'm working out and hopefully I can get some benefit from this. And I'm sure that there's other people out there listening that uh, will have the, have the same experience. So thank yeah, you so much. So too. Yeah. Thank you, Kyle. All right, Bill. Have a good day. All right. All right. You too. All right. Bye. Well, that was Bill Hannon. So that was freaking sweet. Uh, went into a lot of stuff there. I legitimately am ex I'm excited to change my workouts a little bit and just start, you know, maybe getting a little bit stronger because I do feel like I've gotten in a little bit of a rut here, a um, little bit of a plateau. Um, bored is maybe not the right word. I've always been bored of my workouts, <laughs> but uh, that hasn't, hasn't kept me from doing it. But I want to just get a little bit stronger, you know. Um, I've got, I'm small boned. I've got small frame. So a lot of times people think I'm, I weigh more than I do. Most of the time people guess my weight 15 to 20, maybe 25 pounds heavier than it actually is. Um, but I, I wouldn't mind putting on a few more pounds if I could just get stronger. I just, if I could get a little bit stronger, you know, 10, 15% stronger, 20% stronger, 30, whatever it is, I think that'll be an improvement in my riding. I'm not going to become a 235 pound linebacker. I don't care about that. I don't want that. I, you know, I want to look good for my wife, but ultimately I just want to be a little bit stronger, a little bit more fit that way so I can do more things, do more work, um, and feel better and, uh, and feel good about myself that way. And obviously I think that's going to help me on the bike as well. So again, if you guys want to get in touch with uh, Bill, it's engineeredstrength.com. It's engineered underscore, or, yeah, engineer, engineered underscore, underscore strength on Instagram. And a super cool guy, really down to earth. Um, so check out his, uh, his services if, you, if you're interested. And make sure if you're buying stuff for your dirt bike, you're going to use uh, my Rocky Mountain ATV uh, code. It's down in the description here. It's also on my website, and it's on the uh, links on all my YouTube videos. So I think that's what I've got for you today. This, this is probably the longest podcast I've ever uploaded, but tons and tons of good information. Thank you so much for listening and uh, let's leave a single track. Thanks guys. And this will be our last And done.